Welcome to the Unlist. Today we're discussing vetiver, which this is a dual purpose topic because vetiver is both an ingredient in fragrances as well as a genre slash subject. So rather than make two different videos for vetiver subject or vetiver genre perfumes and vetiver as a material, I'm just going to combine them both together into one, which means we'll have less time to cover each aspect of vetiver, but that's fine. I don't think all of you guys want every single pedantic detail anyway, so maybe it's best that we combine them and spend half as much time. So the first half of the video will deal with vetiver as a material. Then the second half of the video will deal with vetiver as a subject and how that's evolved over time with fragrances basing their entire identity around capturing different facets of vetiver. In many cases, going so abstract as to barely even smelling like the material they're trying to capture, right? That's a little weird when that happens, but it does happen. So getting started. Vetiver is a very old perfume material, and uh, it's considered very precious, just like rose oil, ylang-ylang, jasmine, things of that nature, sandalwood, oak moss, various ambers and oud oils. So vetiver, is, in terms of being used in modern Western alcohol-based perfumery, vetiver didn't really take a big place at the table until the early 20th century. So it wasn't until the 1900s that the first vetiver oils were being distilled for French fragrance houses uh, on Reunion Island. Prior to that, vetiver really only found its way into fragrances that were made in the Middle East or the Far East, Southeast Asia, where most people will tell you vetiver kind of gets its starting point. Northern India, places like that, all in and around the Asian continent, Philippines. Vetiver also has medicinal uses, homeopathic uses. It is also good for agriculture. A lot of uh, cultures would plant vetiver in the soil to bind the soil together and to make it easier to grow other things, to stem erosion. So vetiver goes far above and beyond just being a perfume material. But the first French houses started really taking vetiver oil from Reunion Island and distilling that and putting it into their perfumes. Not that there is no possibility of finding perfumes from the 19th century and before that contain some form of vetiver, but the purpose to have the, the material in the fragrance in larger quantities really didn't pick up until the early 20th century. I would not call vetiver a new material for that regard because we're still talking like over 120 some odd years, right, since the early 1900s. But the vetiver oil grown on Reunion Island is no longer really used because Reunion Island has sadly been like over farmed and it's agriculturally now very poor. Uh, lots of droughts happen there and the soil just doesn't really sustain the crop. So uh, there's only a marginal amount of vetiver oil still coming from Reunion Island these days. Mostly countries like uh, Haiti and China have really supplanted, replaced Reunion Island as the source of most natural vetiver found in Western fragrances. Now, the types of vetiver there are, and there are many different types. Most types of vetiver are actually not all that suitable for perfume. You'd be surprised. There are tons of different variations of the vetiver plant, and a lot of them don't get made into vetiver oil. Only a few do, and uh, among the most popular is bourbon vetiver. And bourbon vetiver is usually considered to be of superior quality to other forms of vetiver oil because bourbon vetiver is the type of vetiver oil that has that uh, leathery, round, sort of nutty, almost hazelnut quality, uh, very intensely woody. Very specifically though, that nutty, earthy, rooty, leathery facet of bourbon vetiver, the very complex nature of it, makes it the superior choice for most perfumers. And because it's not very smoky, not very bitter, not very acrid or sharp. It is woody to a degree, but like I said, it is more rooty, nutty, earthy, uh, a little bit leathery, like I said. So 
it's very complex and can be taken in many different directions. Hence, the bourbon vetiver is considered superior and is preferred. Unfortunately, is also one of the uh, more rare types of vetiver oil that you can use, so it's going to be more expensive. Maybe that's why it's called bourbon vetiver as opposed to plain old whiskey. I don't know. <laughs> Bad joke there. Now, the next kind of vetiver that you'll find most common is going to be Javanese vetiver, which is coming from basically China and around mainland China, all the areas in Southeast Asia, Northern India, and Javanese vetiver is the very uh, bitter, slightly uh, woody, sharp, a little bit smoky, but not super duper intensely smoky, but definitely smokier than bourbon vetiver. And it's that woody, sharp, bitter, smoky quality of Javanese vetiver that informs a lot of vetiver fragrances that people claim being smoky, that have a jazz club lounge effect, which then you can take that smokiness of that Javanese vetiver and you can combine it with other materials to further enhance that smoke, right? You can put it next to things like birch, you can put it next to things like clove, and the birch and the clove will enhance the smokiness which, if you ever wondered why a lot of those really super dark, smoky men's fragrances from the early 80s, late 70s, and in the mid 80s, why a lot of them feature vetiver but are very, very smoky, it's because they are based mostly in Javanese vetiver. And then they combine that with the clove, eugenol, basically. Uh, and then they combine it with the birch smoke, and they really make that ashtray vibe. Uh, so there you go. And then last but not least, Definitely not least, okay, it's still a very good vetiver, but the third in this race would be the Haitian vetiver. And Haitian vetiver has, for the most part, just become vetiver. Just your stock, bog standard. When it calls for a vetiver note, you use the Haitian vetiver. And the Haitian vetiver is, again, not the worst by any measure. It's still very good vetiver. But it has that more, uh, I don't want to say generic vetiver profile, because there really isn't a generic vetiver, but the most commonly recognizable, that's, I guess, a better term to use, the most commonly recognizable vetiver smell, where you get that grassiness, you get that uh, green, woody facet. There is perhaps uh, smoke in it, but maybe not as much smoke as the Javanese vetiver has. But really, that uh, just that grassy, verdant, uh, woody, sharp, but not bitter, okay, smoother. So smoother than Javanese vetiver, again. Javanese vetiver is really the intense, smoky, sharp, bad boy in the leather jacket is the Javanese vetiver, while the uh, bourbon vetiver is the superior, upper crusty, dresses real well kind of vetiver. Whereas Haitian vetiver is just your blue jeans, your t-shirt, you know, drives a Chevy pickup truck, eats cheeseburgers, listens to country music, just your basic everyday, every man, you know, uh, red-blooded, blue-collared vetiver is your Haitian vetiver. And anytime you smell a fragrance that has a very grassy, green, woody vetiver note, it's going to be the Haitian vetiver nine times out of ten. And a lot of your more recent designer fragrances that have played around with these grassier, vetiver notes. They are typically playing with Haitian vetiver, not Javanese, not bourbon. Now the thing is, there are also some synthetic vetiver compounds that I will mention before we transition to vetiver as a fragrance subject, but they've never been able to fully synthesize all the complexities of natural vetiver oil. So all they've been able to do is fraction different materials from vetiver and make synthetics like that. And just like with patchouli, these fractions only capture a facet of the vetiver, not the complete. Just like there really isn't any fully complete synthetic patchouli, there really isn't any fully complete synthetic vetiver either. It's so far, the science has eluded them. And that's probably for the best, to be honest with you, because I'd hate to see vetiver go the way of oak moss or go the way of sandalwood or the way of frankincense, and we're just stuck with something like, you know, Avernal, 
or freaking uh, you know um, polysantol or whatever, and or norlimbinol or something, and we're not getting any real vetiver anymore. It's all just some kind of synthetic muck muck, right? I'm glad we're we're not there yet. That we still haven't been able to get there because I'm sure it would be awful, right? But they've tried. They've tried. And a couple worth mentioning would be, you, you've got the uh, <clears throat> vetivanines, you've got the uh, alpha and beta uh, vetivanone, and then of course the most famous one, the one that most perfumers are going to be familiar with, whether you're indie or larger scale industry, is vetiviral acetate. And the vetiviral acetate is really only good at duplicating the grassy aspect of the vetiver. So if you want just the very, very thinnest, and I mean thinnest veneer of a ghostly whisper of vetiver in your perfume, right? And you are really pinched for pennies, really, really pinched for pennies. You've got just the worst, cheapest, most cost optimized, brief imaginable and you've got a client who just will not spend right they just will not spend but you need a vetiver note of some kind you need it you can't be without but you can't spend then i guess in a pinch you can use vetiver acetate it's been done i've smelled it but whenever i smell a fragrance that has vetiver in the pyramid right and then i smell it and all i get is this weird generic nondescript grassiness that could, as far as I know, could be some other compound, right? I'm like, yeah, that's vetiver acetate right there, you know? Again, you get tiny wisps of the woodiness, tiny wisps of the nuttiness, but it's just vague. It's so vague. It's impossibly vague, actually. And when you've had as much experience as I've had smelling real vetivers, then you smell that, and you're just like, no, you know? It's like if you're someone who just uses real sugar in everything, tea, coffee, you know, baking, suddenly someone sticks you with a box of saccharin or a box of aspartame, sweet and low or equal, you know the difference right away, okay? You are not going to mistake equal or sweet and low for real cane sugar. You're just not. Splenda gets you a little closer, but still not quite there. So vetiver acetate is not even Splenda. It's like on the equal and sweet and low tier of just vaguely resembling sugar and like the most abstract way. That's how bad it is. So like I said, we are lucky that we don't have anything that really gets you in the neighborhood of vetiver or else I'm sure all of these caustic, narcissistic, sociopathic, corporate ghouls out there who just want to run the whole planet into the ground to make enough money to buy just one more mega yacht, right? They would have us on that synthetic vetiver and put all the farmers out of business if they could. They would because they're just like, they're just that way, man. Luckily, we're not there yet. So now we're on the second half of the video where we talk about vetiver as a subject. So the thing is, surprise, surprise, most vetiver subject fragrances don't just feature vetiver. You can't really make a vetiver single material fragrance because even a vetiver by itself is a wonderful, lovely, complex oil. It just can't sit by itself. It has more of a fixative quality than it does anything else. So you need to put other things with it in order to make it project, to make it last, to really have certain parts of the vetiver communicate to the nose, right? To be focused on, extrapolated and projected, you know, onto the skin, onto the passersby who smell your sillage and all that stuff. So the really early vetiver subject fragrances were, of course, just called vetiver, right? Just like other perfumes from antiquity where this brand has rose and that brand has rose. And sometimes you may say rose de mai or uh, te rose or rose bulgari or whatever, but invariably the fragrances are all just called rose, right? At some form. Well, that's how vetiver was. A lot of the earliest vetiver fragrances were just this brand vetiver, that brand vetiver. And the one that kind of started it all was carbon. Carvin came out with the first recognized vetiver subject fragrance in 1957 called Carvin Vetiver. Surprise. And it was almost a sheep ray in the way it was built with patchouli and oak moss 
and bergamot and some other materials. Vetiver was definitely a part of the structure. You would not mistake it as a perfume that was about something else. But in terms of the various vetiver fragrances that would come out after it, carbon vetiver was definitely the most uh, worked on. It's not the most uh, straightforward of vetivers, of all the vetivers, but it is very good. But you're going to definitely get big slug of oak moss in that, big slug of other materials. It is built up like a proper perfume. It is not singularly focusing on vetiver like some of the later ones would. Like the very next one, actually, would be Vetiver by Givenchy, 1959. So the Givenchy Vetiver was originally a bespoke fragrance. It was originally made just for Hubert de Givenchy, and he wore it himself. It wasn't sold to the public. It was just his. But because you can't make industry-level fragrances in small quantities, you can't. So they had to drum up enough oil to make lots of bottles. So they did end up having a small surplus, and that small surplus would be stocked at a small handful of Givenchy boutiques, not department stores, not high street fragrance boutiques either, or any other kind of retail environment. Strictly Givenchy's own boutiques, he would take some of his surplus bottles of vetiver because he couldn't wear it all himself, right? And he would sell those bottles to the public, but he would not even advertise that it was there. It would be stocked, and that was it. If you knew about it, somehow a little bird told you basically in your ear, and you knew to ask for it, then they would sell it to you. So it was one of those if you know, you know kind of things. And his vetiver, which again was his bespoke fragrance for a while, was probably the most dedicated singular vetiver fragrance we'd see. It was just simply... Haitian vetiver. It was Haitian vetiver and a little bit of bergamot and a little bit of oak moss and something else. It was a one, two, three strikes you're out. Very pure, very to the point vetiver. Very light too. Obviously it was a cologne, very light fragrance. It was called eau de vetiver in the beginning. The first bottles were eau de vetiver and then eventually it was just vetiver after that. Givenchy spelled with a Y. It has the alternate spelling. It's not the I spelling, it's the Y spelling of vetiver. The next one that would come out <clears throat> would be considered by a lot of people to be the reference vetiver. And I will not argue whether it is or it isn't. I greatly enjoy it. But the last of these three early vetivers was Guerlain's vetiver from 1961. Some will say that it came out in 59, the same year as Givenchy's vetiver. But... If that was true, it was a soft launch. It was not an official release year. It was one of those, let's see if people like this kind of thing. But the official release year from Guerlain is 1961 for, for Guerlain Vetiver. So that's what I stick with. And in 61, this fragrance comes out and it does kind of change the world in regards to Vetiver. It uses bourbon Vetiver, whereas the uh, Givenchy used Haitian, we used a, yeah, Haitian vetiver, and then I'm assuming Carvin also used Haitian vetiver, but the Guerlain definitely used bourbon vetiver, and because the Guerlain used bourbon vetiver, it has that very rounded, leathery, complex, nutty aspect to it. And it is a more complex fragrance than the Givenchy, perhaps on the same level of complexity as the carbon, but the dosage of vetiver is higher. So even though it is a fully realized composition like the carbon is, it's not a simple one, two, three punch, it still very much is all about that bourbon vetiver. So if you don't like that leathery, woody, nutty, earthy aspect of the bourbon vetiver, if you're not all about it, you have no business going near that Guerlain vetiver. You won't like it. And then from there on out, we had Lanvin would put out some vetiver fragrances. There would be a Monsieur Lanvin vetiver flanker. Um, Le Gallien would make a vetiver too. Uh, you'd see some other fragrances come out that featured vetiver, but weren't necessarily vetiver perfumes. Like uh, Eau Sauvage had some vetiver in it that was well pronounced, even though that was mostly a Hesperitic fragrance. It did have vetiver in it. You would also see stuff like um, uh, 
Parfums Dorsey. Dorsey would come out with Les Nomad in 74. And Les Nomad also featured a very weirdly milky, lactonic representation of vetiver. Very strange. I don't think there's any fig in that fragrance, but somehow, some sort of way, they made the vetiver have a very weird milky texture, even though it's still green, still vetivery, right? But just that's the way it was handled. We'd see a lot of Avon fragrances play with vetiver too. Uh, some stuff like Weekend, uh, some stuff like Windjammer, handful of other colognes. They would use the Javanese vetiver though, which is why those fragrances have a slight smokiness to them. Windjammer from 68 had some smokiness. Weekend from 78, 79 had some smokiness. Um, they also have clary sage in them as well, and oak moss and tonka and some other things, but you get that Javanese vetiver profile in those fragrances. And those were down market mail order because it's Avon, right? Then keep on cruising into the 80s and all those big smoky jazz club kind of things I was telling you about. Stuff like uh, Giacomo di Giacomo from 1980 and Open by Roger and Galay and then uh, into the 90s we'd have Aramis, Havana. All of them play around with that very smoky Javanese vetiver material I was mentioning earlier. That's why they are so smoky. It is vetiver, it's just a Javanese vetiver, and then they pair it with clove, they pair it with the birch in some cases, not in the case of the Aramis, but you know, they do other things to enhance the smokiness further <clears throat> from what the Javanese already has apparent in it. <coughs> and then we get really abstract vetivers, okay? Things that don't quite hit as a vetiver. One that never gets talked about is uh, Quartz Pour Homme from 94. Uh, Molly No would come out with a men's version of Quartz, you know, almost 20 years later because the original Quartz was 77, right? So the men's quartz comes out in 94, and it too has a very prominent grassy vetiver note, very grassy vetiver note in that quartz pour homme. So that is more of the Haitian vetiver once again. So back to the, like I said, that, that blue jeans and t-shirt vetiver. Then we would see vetiver extraordinaire. Dominique Ropion would make vetiver extraordinaire in 2002. Maybe it was 2000, I don't remember. It could be 2000, 2002, somewhere in there. That one is not really to my liking. I'm not a fan of Vetiver Extraordinaire, but I understand why people like it. It processed the Vetiver in such a way that a lot of those other elements, the leatheriness, the smokiness, the bitterness, were kind of excised, like surgically excised. And what you're left with is a very clean, grassy, almost soapy Vetiver profile. And that's why I'm not a fan of that. It was a very similar thing to what Mugler Cologne did with Vetiver and what, to an extent, Creed would do again with original Vetiver, where they would isolate certain facets. And I just, I like my Vetiver to be, you know, <clears throat> full flavor, like marble red cigarettes. I don't want no silver, gold, lights, ultra lights. I don't want my Vetiver to be sent through a filter, okay? I want all of it to hang out, right? I want the love handles to come out of that vetiver, okay? That may be a little weird for some of y'all, but I like that. I want something to grab onto. I don't just want no skinny, anorexic, lip service jeans wearing vetiver. It's not me, it's not my bag, okay? So I wasn't a real big fan of those type of vetiver fragrances. Then we would see stuff like, well, well, gray vetiver, right, by Tom Ford. That's another one that kind of goes more into the grassy direction. So once again, we're back into the Haitian vetiver territory. And now we've got just so many different niche takes on vetiver. And I'm not going to name those, but some that I like. I like the Murdoch vetiver is very good. And then, of course, we can't go without saying uh, Lalique uh, Ancre Noir, which was another bourbon vetiver example, by the way. Very good bourbon vetiver execution in the Ancre Noir from 2006. Terre de Hermes gets cited for vetiver, and vetiver is definitely an important part of Terre de Hermes, but I feel like that is more of a cedarwood fragrance and patchouli fragrance than vetiver, except for its flanker. Its flanker that was focused on vetiver could be arguably called a vetiver fragrance, but Terre de Hermes OG, not really a vetiver fragrance in my opinion. All right, guys, hope you learned something. Catch you next time.